Great. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Nimka Kulumia Hussein, Associate Creator and Events Programmer at Arbeit Gallery, joined by Arbeit's Creator Rebecca Edwards. We have invited Creator and Art Historian Monica Bejo and Creator and Art Critic Noreen Khan to expand on the possibilities of quantum computing inside and outside of the art world by using Libby Healy's current solo exhibition at Arbeit Gallery, The Evolution of N, QX, which is currently on show until 20th of August 2022. Nora and Khan is a curator, editor and writer on digital visual culture, the politics of software and philosophy of emerging technology. She is the executive director of Project X for art and criticism, publishing extra contemporary art journal in Los Angeles. She is also the next curator for the next Biennale, De Limage and Mouvement, in 2023 with Andrea Bellini, hosted by Central Art Contemporary in Geneva. Thank you for joining us today, Nora. Next, we have curator and art historian Maneka Bejo. Since 2015, she has been the curator and head of arts at CERN at the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, home of the Large Hadron Collider. Arts at CERN fosters dialogue between artists and scientists at one of the world's leading laboratories, where Monica leads the artistic residencies at the lab, the art commissions, and the exhibitions in collaboration with leading cultural organizations. More recently, she is the curator of the Icelandic Pavilion for the Venice Biennale 2022. Thank you for joining us today, Monica. And finally, we have Libby Healy, a British artist who holds a PhD in quantum information science from the University of Leeds and an MA in art and science from, the, from Central St. Martins, University of the Arts, London. As well as quantum computing, Healy's practice incorporates AI, CGI, and VR technology, using each tool critically to investigate how and who they empower and disempower. The resulting moving image works, performances, and interactive experiences hold multiple dichotomies being both analog and digital, spectacle and interrogation, and concerning both nature and technology, revealing a web of often overlooked relations. Often, he and his work subverts the typical uses of these technologies, examining and reshaping languages and environments, forcing her tools to work against themselves to expose their drawbacks and dangers. Frequently, inspired by surrealism and dadaism, he and his work incorporates affect, humor, and nonsense to investigate relationships between humans and non-humans, capitalism and alternatives, subjectivity, truth and perceptions of reality, as well as our desires around new technologies. Glad to have you here, Libby. Commissioned by LAS, Light Art Space, and first shown at the Shearing Stiftung in Berlin, the 360 projection ENT takes audiences through three earthly layers of quantum experiments containing quantum hybrid life forms and pulsating liquid worlds filled with fantastical creatures zipping in and out of dimensions. In this panel discussion, we will unpack and discuss key ideas at play in the exhibition, such as the use of fiction and narrative as a tool for inquiry, the role of capitalism and consumer-based content when talking about advancements in technology, and the use of the speculation and science fiction when presenting works that sit between the borders of fact and fiction. Quantum solidifications asks us to rethink the new technologies are revered and idolized to the point of ab abstraction, and instead how we can allow for a more slippery and non-binary explorations into the field of new technology. Next, Rebecca will briefly introduce our Byte Gallery and our arts program. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Rebecca Edwards. I'm the curator at our Byte. Thanks so much for joining us uh, this evening or wherever you are in the world, um, and welcome to this event, which is part of, as Minko said, part of Libby Heaney's exhibition, The Evolution of Ent QX, which is on show at Arbeit Gallery until August the 20th. Nimco is actually in the space right now, which is cool. I've got a little bit, a little video simulation of it behind me and Libby's got the version from Berlin. So hope you can make it down. Um, but for those who don't know Arbeit, uh, we're a not-for-profit gallery. Uh, bringing innovative perspectives to art through digital technologies and we're based in East London. Uh, we run a digital art program at the intersection of new technologies and contemporary culture and we present artists, international, local artists working within critical thinking and innovations in computer technologies. Our programs invite multiple voices in the digital realm to present new physical installations at the gallery, as well as online experiences as part of Arbeit on Screen, which is our online program. 
The talk today, Quantum Slamifications, is part of Arbeit's 2022 artistic program, which continues on from last year's program titled Realities. But this year, we present artists and artworks surrounding science fiction, science speculation, and science fact. And the aim of the program is to really kind of unpick our current reality and present an exploration through various forms of speculative fiction or fictions, proposing imaginative and innovative concepts for a new kind of futurism, as well as mapping a new realm that we can unfold, um, a realm or a domain that incorporates ways to promote new ways of inhabiting, carving out and finding spaces to exist within. Um, you can find out more about our programme on our website, but for now, I would like to introduce or hand over to Libby to tell us about the evolution of NQX. And I'm going to share a little um, video installation that we made as well, so that anyone who's not seen the show can have a look at what, it, what the projection looks like. OK, um, so thank you, Rebecca, and thanks to everyone here um, who will be speaking today, as well as people watching at home or elsewhere. Um, so the work, the show at Arbeit Gallery essentially is an extension of the um, work ENT that I made, which was commissioned by Light Art Space to investigate um, the future of quantum computing, but also uses quantum computing as a media medium as well. Um, and it and as you can see in the images, the videos Rebecca is showing right now, is um, an immersive space. It's kind of a total space, and it invites participants or, or audience members to really embrace um, ideas from quantum physics, quantum computing um, through their bodies. So we, you can see we have a floor projection there. So quite often when people come into the space, they really feel quite destabilized or moved by the work and um, I really wanted groups of people to interact with the work as well I didn't want you know like I wanted to work with a games engine because I feel in a games engine we can you know games engines um, are based on physics um, they, they have physics um, engines within them and they they really um, you know often use Newtonian physics or things or Newtonian plus physics whereas when I'm working with quantum computing um, which is based on a different type of physics, a type of physics that, um, you know, is beyond the Newtonian. It describes a microscopic world, how atoms and molecules interact and exchange energy. We can still reveal traces of this sort of fluid microscopic world through simulation. It's impossible to visualize everything because it's too, too high dimensional, too complex, but we can get traces of this and this is what we've done. So I work with a games engine. And then because I wanted to immerse the audience, I chose to work with, with um, a projected space as opposed to something like virtual reality or AR, because it allows for groups of people to really experience the work together. And this idea of collectiveness relates to concepts from quantum uh, physics like entanglement, where two, two or more entities become st so strongly correlated that there's no concept of the individual anymore. So ENT really encourages it. First of all, it visualizes some traces of processes within a quantum computer, these new, this new technology that's rapidly being developed by big tech companies and some universities still. Um, and it sort of proposes um, a set of relations through the visuals some, situated somewhere between heaven and hell. It draws on Bosch's um, essential panel from Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, because I think when working with such an advanced technology, um, I have to be really mindful that some of the audience members that are um, coming to see the work won't know anything about it. So I use Bosch as like an access point for people because it's very famous and allows me to talk about some of the themes of the work. Um, I think I might stop there because I mean I don't want I could speak all day <laughs> about the show so I think I think that's a nice starting point and you saw the videos and then we can come back and touch on the work um, throughout I mean I think we're going to show some more clips as well throughout so Amazing. I think I'm passing back over to Nimco. Thank you Libby. Um, maybe I could start off this panel discussion by quoting Rebecca's text on science fiction Quote, science fiction has been seen as a medium that sparks the imagination and provokes ideas of how life might be in years to come. 
With these vast opportunities and fantastic dreams, sci-fi has also informed and created a narrative of self-fulfilling desires in which our imagination is structured and constructed. But the last decades have brought new ways in which science fiction is perceived, discussed and developed. From a predominantly white cis male gaze to an opening up of diverse and marginalized authors and narratives, science fiction as a genre is becoming more fluid. So similarly, I think um, in your work, Libby, um, it can be approached as a set of critical questions investigated by the use of quantum technologies. Both fictional and scientific approaches inform the evolution of end QX. I would like to then ask, how can we think critically and otherwise by utilizing both fact and fiction? And if you could go first, maybe. So back to me, right? So, um, so, so quantum computing is a really, will be a really powerful new technology. Quantum computers will be able to solve problems that could never be solved, even on the best, you know, the biggest super big computers, um, because it, it's quantum computing is based on the laws of quantum physics. That means it can, in a way, compute many different things in parallel as opposed to sequentially like in digital computers. So quantum computers aren't fully developed yet. They're still in the infancy. I think IBM currently has the so-called best quantum computer with 127 quantum bits, um, but there's this sort of race to develop the world's first quantum computer. And um, because of that, so I wanted to be critical of something I wanted to be critical of quantum computing, but um, let me just change your view, sorry. I wanted to be um, critical of quantum computing, but around um, the future. So things that haven't happened yet, but I think will happen with that technology. And in order to do that, I mean, you know, I make these predictions of what will happen in the future because of what's happened in the past, um, through how the internet's been deployed, um, how uh, the rapid, develop of machine le rapid development of machine learning and neural networks and how machine learning and neural networks have been used, um, I guess, since like the early noughties, but with, um, I mean, gosh, there's so much to say here, but in terms of how they privilege certain ways of seeing, how they have many biased applications, how... Um, they benefit the sort of cement and freeze and um, reinforce the status quo. So I predict uh, that quantum computing, despite all of the sort of uh, positive rhetoric around it, um, you know, so for instance, um, scientists say, oh, we'll be able to solve um, energy problems and optimize, um, you know, optimize, uh, things to save energy and so on. There's many things that quantum computers will do that will help with, say, the climate crisis, but also there's this negative undercurrent that doesn't really get spoken about, which exists and people can find that already um, that quantum computers are being positioned to help the oil industry. Um, quantum machine learning is a huge area of research, but none of this is being deployed yet because the technology is not ready, but the theory is getting there. And so, so my, my prediction, and this is why I've, I've sort of relied on fiction to some extent, is, is to kind of like enable myself to be critical of something that hasn't happened yet. So I'm projecting into the future based on past knowledge. And, um, and but then in the works that, that you'll see in the show, and I'm sure, I think we'll be showing some clips of them shortly, I've used a lot of text from big tech companies developing quantum computers and startups sort of the capitalist narratives around quantum computing. So a lot of text in the show is, um, yeah, thanks Rebecca, that's perfect, um, is um, real text. So all of this, all of these screen grabs are from tech companies. If you Google these, this, this, um, these, these words, then you'll probably find out which tech companies wrote them. But then, all of this is through the lens of a fictional company, QX, that I set up to kind of allow myself to talk through the voice of capitalism and through the voice of, of big tech. And then also it allowed me to kind of be critical of myself. I've made a, an immersive experience that you saw earlier. Um, immersive experiences are quite, you know, they're quite expensive to develop. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have backing from Light Art Space to do that. And they're also quite, um, you know, a spectacle. They're quite Instagrammable. 
Um, so I wanted to kind of reflect on what I'd done because, um, you know, I want I chose that format because I wanted people to feel with their bodies and to be immersed in this sort of new world, become destabilized. I'm also aware I'm sort of, you know, um, working in this very capitalistic area. So there's a video that you see at the end of the exhibition that really um, critiques Ent in a way and, and looks at the problematic between art and big tech. And, and places end with the immersive work in the frame, you know, sort of says like, how might a future quantum com com quantum computing company use, use um, art to sell its tools and to also extract data from its users. And then that data kind of feeds, feeds the sort of quantum machine learning algorithms. So I'm straddling fact and fiction, I don't think you know, I think we can learn a lot from quantum mechanics about fact and fiction, which which we could go into shortly. But I'm going to stop talking in a minute. Um, but I think I think I don't think fact and fiction are a binary. I think I think we can. I think they're always entangled, and I sort of play on that throughout the show. So who's it's, next, Inka? Is it Nora next? <laughs> well, Nora can respond. <laughs> Thanks so much, Libby, and uh, thanks to Arbyte for having us. It's so lovely to be in conversation with you, Libby, and with Monica today. So I'm just, I'm delighted to be here. These are all my favorite topics. Um, so, you know, from my own experiences, this question of distinguishing between fact and fiction is uh, interesting in that the facts of science and technology are so deeply informed by fiction and narrative. I mean, they dance together as we obviously see showcased in this work. And I think of fictions themselves as you know, very seductive systems that motivate belief, they inculcate belief, they motivate people into action, they motivate work in the world. And they're so crucial at these moments, these cusp moments that Libby is describing in her work, right on the cusp of possibility of like this beautiful future to come. And it's also a moment to reiterate the ways that facts themselves are subject to review and change and iteration and provisional thinking, right? That require uh, you know, multiple narratives to be tested and discarded to make facts be believed. So when I think of critical thinking, which I think about a lot, I think of it as being able to move between the system of fact and the systems of fiction, where fiction is building a world with certain propositions about human behavior and action and the system of belief fact or like the truths, I will try not to do too many air quotes, but the truths we take as facts requires the dance and seduction of this changing set of fictions that entices and pulls people in. And so when it's done very bluntly, it's uh, you know, very powerful marketing when done deftly, and we'll be talking about science fiction, when done definitely with a kind of future in mind or specific future in mind, you know, fiction obviously can change um, in the course of history. So in these videos, in the ENT QX videos, what I'm really appreciative of is the way Libby have condensed each driving fiction that's aligned with technological change. So you have the promise of innovation. Um, at some point, the voice says, we we're about to reach our full human potential. There's uh, frontierism and uncharted territory, this frontier that we're about to like come into that we must claim. And at some point during this, I'm thinking who is we and what territory are we claiming? Just the abstraction is also being built in my mind. Um, the kind of unified march to this grand future that we're all headed towards, quantum leaps of progress, um, acceleration. And what I'm struck by as I am struck by in, talking about machine learning and researching it and, and thinking with artists who are thinking critically about it is a way these narratives repeat. We've heard them so many times before since the whole earth catalog and the early promises of what the internet could have been to now. And throughout that, the progress, uh, what I'm struck most by is a consistent narrative of computational progress. The more powerful algorithms we have to these heights of unimaginable processing power um, once we get there, we'll be able to solve the problems of our time. So I think it's incredibly instructive to think of each of these concepts as a powerful fiction that creates the world, that creates reality, that produces facts, investments and resources and gas moving across the world. People are motivated to build and align and collaborate based on the story of more accurate measurement 
or better prototyping or um, you know, better aesthetic immersive experiences. But each, each of these fictions is still a proposition that's based on a what could be and what only, and our, our reality is all these coarse grain models that create facts in the world. So uh, we see this in crypto and blockchain and machine learning. So it's just very powerful to me that in recognizing the fiction that underpins the fact, there's always opportunity to change in the facts of where we are. I'll, I'll pause there. I'd just like to come in here, Nora, because I was reading um, one of the chapters in your book, Seeing, Naming, Knowing, and, and you kind of you kind of criticize maybe or maybe just kind of want to change some of the wording that Bridal writes about this kind of like he talks about re-enchantment of tools and, and the way that you talk about there needs to be a critical activation of tools instead. Um, you said that it's like re-enchanting is almost like the wrong word. Um, and so not to further mystify, but to make them more sensible. So to create, to, so to make critical thinking essential to activating these tools. And I think that's something I think about quite a lot when we're talking about these like storytelling or narrative works is like, where is the boundary between being critical, but also being kind of like having them exist in this world that is perhaps reality adjacent. Um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think the, you know, as a writer, I'm easily enchanted by a great story and great narrative. And so to have the critical side of one step in to override the side that is um, you know, locked into a well-told story about human potential and who we could be and, um, and aligning it with the facts of the moment of how his technology, how have technological promises um, enacted great you know, chaos or destruction or um, not in the sense of you know, being a naysayer or, or you know, advocating to, to be a Luddite, but instead to see how fiction um, drives technological investment and, and change and how do we avoid remystifying the tools, especially which happens a lot in art and tech kind of discourse. But um, I won't go on a rant about how art is used by technology quite yet, maybe in a bit. Thanks, Rebecca. Maybe if I, I can add, I think, um... Since I, I work uh, with artists uh, in a laboratory that is not only the largest, but also the most uh, diverse and, uh, yeah, and also an iconic place of science, a symbolic place of science, I, I often think why artists uh, want to come to this place where uh, you feel often uh, discomfort and awkward because the lack of information that, uh, well, the lack of uh, understanding and uh, often, and, and the lack of tools. So the tools are there, but uh, these hands-on tools that everyone imagine are out of reach um, for different reasons. One of them is that many of the tools and the instruments, the experiments are subjected to radiation. So your body would not accept this phenomena, these frequencies. Um, so, um, so that, but this is a generic, a fundamental question for me. What art is today in relation to science? And in relation to science, understanding science uh, as a fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental science. So a way to inquire about our nature, reality, and the, and the big questions, the big unanswered questions. So, um, but when I think about this dance, suddenly I see these individual artists uh, being welcomed to a place where there's 15,000 people working in a single question. And, uh, and there is this, uh, yeah, the consequence of this realization is that at this, um, yeah, the, 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 this dichotomy of uh, collaborative or collective body uh, versus the individual, which is a big question in contemporary artistic practices, and I think is unresolved. And I don't think art is going to resolve this on its own, like this artistic song where we have the answers, we don't. And uh, so the constitution or the uh, fundamental constituents of what art is today is to be answered. And I think uh, in the work of Livy as well as in the work of many artists dealing with big complex societal questions, there is the question of uh, being together. How 
how to deal with this together in places that are not made for art often. So finding places. But um, but then while I was listening to you, just jumping into uh, another idea, there is a topic that many artists come to CERN to deal with, which is time. And I recall this uh, conference of uh, uh, Mark Fisher, I don't remember, ages ago, in, and I, I watched it in YouTube. I was probably too young <laughs> or, or not in the right place where he, uh, he was talking about cyberspace and cyberspace time. So um, maybe leaving my question is how this future that uh, quantum computing technologies and companies are describing is going to trans transform again and uh, it's going to yeah, create another cyberspace time, but quantum space time, and this is going to really be yeah um yeah not too nice probably <laughs> or maybe uh are we ready for this concept of time that is being manipulated again by new liberal practices with technologies and uh so yeah many questions there to yeah to reflect upon Uh, Libby, would you go? Oh, wait. Rebecca, can you see Libby? No, we appear to have lost Libby, but let's maybe continue the conversation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. while we wait for Libby to rejoin us. Okay. Um, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Monica and, and Nora. I think it's quite interesting in terms of you know, the use of uh, Libby's, the fabricated pseudo company of applied quantum computing. Um, I think it raises uh, questions of power, um, governance, also concerns regarding the use of new technologies as capitalist devices. Um, so what would you say is the role of language here, uh, whether it is visual or literal, uh, in thinking, speculating, and imagining otherwise in your respective practices, um, Monica and Nora? And if you would like to actually go first, Nora. Hey, sorry, my internet just totally randomly cut off. <laughs> I'm really curious what Monica was asking because she was about to ask something and then it just went. Can oh, we I'm, I'm, I'm actually, sorry, Livia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I actually had uh, this, this question. I don't know if uh, it was not a question, it was more a remark <laughs> about uh, yeah, the potential of uh, yeah the, the transformation or, uh, a new a renewed way of thinking of time through quantum technologies how this would affect us because uh, i quote uh, mark fisher when he was saying something about uh, I saw, I saw cyber that space and time uh, but this was in the 2000s and uh, yeah. now we are yeah, very inside the 21st century and uh, and we are not dealing with time or this is still a very very big question yeah, I feel like, I mean, time is a huge area in quantum physics, quantum mechanics, um, this idea of nonlinear time in the arts, people most know about it through Karen Barad. Um, I have friends in science working on, and time, well, wow, time is related to information processing, so you can explore time with quantum computing for sure. Um, I mean, just what I was thinking about um, earlier, um, in these weeks preparing for this talk was how thick like quantum physics allows us to uh, really think about the connection between fact and fiction and um, it, this brings time into it maybe i'll just say a few words about this because i think it's really relevant to our conversation so there's a paper um a very famous paper in science maybe you've heard of it it's um, called the epr paper the epr paradox it's from 1935 it's einstein Podolsky and Rosen, and there they show that reality at its most fundamental is non-real, meaning you can't assign truth to objects, and also non-local. Um, so there's mathematical technical definitions, but I'll try to explain it um, 
in a way that hopefully is like quite accessible. But essentially, if you take an object like an atom or something that obeys the laws of quantum mechanics, it exists, it's related to superposition, it exists in all possibilities at once. And, and that is kind of not being real. It hasn't got its own fixed properties. And then when someone measures it, or when something measures it, it doesn't need to be a human. It brings a set of those properties into being. Yeah, but then actually it's more complicated than that. What happens is there's different mutually exclusive ways of bringing reality into being. Um, so if, if something measures this atom in a certain way, I'm using my hands to kind of describe it, it brings one reality into being, but it could have been measured in different ways and different possibilities would have, would have come out. But once that measurement has taken place, all the others have been irreversibly destroyed. And those possibilities, those futures have, have, have been collapsed or erased, I think as Barrett would say. And from that, you can get to this, I mean, you're destroying you, I mean, time in quantum physics, uh, the Schrodinger equation, doesn't really exist in the sense that we have scientists have to insert time sort of um, manually. It's like ad hoc. Time can flow forwards or backwards in, in quantum computing. It, actually, quantum computing is a reversible type of com computation. It's very different to like digital computers, which is is irre irreversible type of com uh, computation. Um, and if that's why it throws a lot of heat. And that's also why quantum measurement, which takes quantum of quantum fluidity back to the classical world, the digital world, the Newtonian world, throws out heat and, and um, entropy and this change. This change, this increase of, in entropy, this increase of heat gives us this arrow of time, time flows forward, this linearity, and then you get ideas like this linear progress, that's, you know, this, this marching forward but if we stay within the realms of quantum physics where we haven't collapsed the wave function then time is fluid and it can flow forwards or backwards and and in, I mean, you see this in my work actually um not necessarily a bit where rebecca is on at the moment but some of the forms perhaps behind me if this was animated everything falls apart but then comes back together in the sense that entropy doesn't just increase and then that's it there's no linearity to time time is cyclic or time can reverse and so on and i think i think look, probing this through quantum computers um, will allow us to probe multiple fictions simultaneously as opposed to just like um just this one re reality or these powerful i mean i guess i guess what nora was saying is there's these powerful fictions all the time anyway so maybe in some sense we are we have got these parallel worlds but they're all being generated in the name of capital, but using quantum computing, if artists were to use it, I think they could probe and explore times where we go into all of these other possibilities that capital capitalism doesn't necessarily allow us. These are just ideas I'm making up as I go along. <laughs> I hope it makes sense. <laughs> just like drawing on what I know about quantum <laughs> physics. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that, Monica or Nora, but it could be interesting to open up new, new ideas or something. Or we can move on. I think I think the capacity of uh, uh, of time you know, to to produce fictions and to produce another ways of understanding, yeah, the relations and in our world is yeah, it's very powerful. It's, uh, it creates huge and powerful metaphors, and uh, and we can decide to follow this lead as as time as an instrument or as time as a yeah, fundamental, the overall yeah, way of uh, experiencing reality, this single reality or yeah, multiple reality. But um, it is definitely something that brings attention to many, to, to many uh, artists that come to CERN, the, the trying to understand what is time? Not only in this, from a perspective of uh, uh, of physics, but also the the experience of time. So a physicist might not might experience time in the way we experience it, but there is another understanding. Another there is is a much richer trope, uh, I think, for a physicist. 
I think that this question of science fiction, which Nimka was starting to ask about how, how we think about science fiction in relation to this, the narratives in the videos ask if we're ready for a world with even more screens uh, that are super energy efficient and explore light, where I as a viewer am like sharpened by this promise of endless screens, perfect batteries, you know, in my most uncritical moments, so just like a world of, um, you know, theory, the, a perfectly simulated world that simulates nature as we know it. So that's, there's a lot of beautiful science fiction that is just two steps removed from our own reality. So what I think of with quantum computing as it relates to science fiction is I'd not only want to know what the end point of computational logic would be, whether it's a more perfect AI or more, a more most perfectly simulated nature, not only towards the ends of entertainment and experiences and, and capital extraction um, of data, you know, extracted by quantum algorithms by these like satellites that love it, uh, really stay on that image of the satellite that this perfectly controlled remove. And we wish we could talk about those, um, those algorithms too. But I think the other part of the science fiction around quantum computing would be what will life feel like in this world past, past uh, the achievement of this state. I feel like a great science fiction would describe life not just in the end state, but all of the intermediary states that we'll have to go through from classical computers using quantum methods and all of the quandaries that will be involved and mistakes and missteps on the way to this perfect um, end, end state. So I think of sci-fi and science fiction as predictive, like a, a series of predictive models that see at the end point of, of contemporary values or contemporary logic. Like I'm in uh, Los Angeles right now and pretty sure like the opening scene of Blade Runner was either 2021 or 2022. And like current day Los Angeles doesn't feel that much different or removed with, with the exception of the airships overhead. You have a little Neuromancer thrown in there. You have Octavia Butler's um, Parable of the Sour where you know, she predicted the end state of technocratic and authoritarian logic fused together, taken to its actual logical end, which is a society that is struggling in the wake and the ruins of, you know, neoliberal logic. So I'm very excited to think of the proposition that Libby is making of what kind of science fiction world building exercises that move away from the protagonist hero and the frontier and everyone else abject in the wake of the metropolis in the future. Um, and and think in, in working with programmers and engineers who start to weave poetics into their work or start to really think about the science fiction underpinning um, the tools that they're using. There's always this delight of recognition of the same story repeating across tech and systems or origin states. I think what science fiction around uh, quantum computing could do is like to map out the years ahead of what it will feel like to move from the AI ML you know, embeddedness that we're in now to this other state. So psychologically, how it will feel, how it will feel from day to day or experience of time and interrelation with others. Thank you, Nora. And also, I think that this brings us to the title of our panel discussion, Quantum Slimifications, uh, which refers to slime, an integral part of your show, Libby. Um, and as it reads in the exhibition booklet, Quote, slime operates as a metaphor for slimy and insidious connotations surrounding big tech related to disgust and deviousness. Quote, quantum particles behave like slimy substances through their wave and particle properties, blurring, morphing, melting, congealing, and safe shifting, suggesting that quantum computers could instead be used to move away from the binary to a plural, shape shifting landscape of deep interconnections, where the very notion of the individual even becomes irrelevant. Um, so maybe we could talk about slime a little bit and also its uh, properties as almost this kind of a critical tool. Um, and yeah, I think that maybe Libby, if you could tell us a bit more about the role slime has when navigating through complex quantum processes. I mean, yeah, I guess we have to touch on it because it's in the title of this talk and it's been appearing in my work, not only at Arbeit, um, but also in a follow-up sort of performative lecture at Zabladovich in London, the collection in London. I've actually got one of the little black boxes full of slime from the performance here. And you can just hear 
it feels really creepy because it's sealed and I know what's in there but I don't know because the performance took place like um a few weeks ago months ago now I don't know um it might have dried up and there's this sort of Nora was like what does it feel like what might the future of quantum computing feel like and I have this black box and even though I have knowledge of what's inside it I can hear something liquid which is too liquid to be slime now and I'm a bit nervous has the slime gone moldy is it is it I mean it's made from synthetic material but I can see it's been trying to seep out here and and this sense that it's given me of like whether I open this black box and have a look at what what it's turned into or do I just leave it closed is an uncanny feeling that you know a strange feeling that of knowing and not knowing what's going to happen and I guess that so I've been I guess that just talking about this now is like why I'm using slime in my work um to kind of have I mean it plays multiple roles really um you know it's conceptually and to embody um ideas around the future of quantum computing in many different ways um, and to allow people to maybe touch it because there's an installation part of um, a physical part of um, the show at Arbite, which is a hellscape that I built to kind of take the hell from the projection out of the box. So there's a collage behind, out when you come out of the black box from end, there's a collage that's made from scenes from end, but then I've made it physical in the slime that drips down this hellscape. And sometimes people touch it or poke it, or maybe it's dried out and barren. So I'm, I'm not being necessarily didactic there and talking about the futures of how it will feel to like live in a quantum world, but I'm using slime as this embodied, this material, icky something that allows us to think, think of these things. Um, like slime for me, quantum particles are slime-like. Um, they exist as a wave and they can spread out over space and when I invite people who visit my show sometimes I have some fresh slime with me and I give them a handful and they start dragging it out and as I'm talking about quantum they're kind of thinking about it through their hands and I think that's really important to think of this experience this fluidity um, through touch um, touch relates to Karen Barrard. Um, she has this wonderful essay called On Touching the Inhuman, that therefore I am. And she relates, she says, when you touch, it's actually electrons and the electromagnetic force um, sort of stopping your hand, I suppose, falling through something that you're touching. And then when you're touching, because the electron is quantum and quantum particles are in multiple states at the same time. And through particle physics, they can touch each other and touch each other and touch each other. And they have this, this idea of touching yourself and touching all of us when you touch yourself. I mean, maybe I don't read, I mean, perhaps Rebecca can put the um, essay, a link to the essay. Um, if you Google it, there's um, a PDF online. Um, you can put it in the chat so but really like slime allows people to kind of have this idea of touching something disgusting if I open if I open this uh, box and I touch it you know when we did the performance at Zavladovich people opened the box in the dark and they didn't know what was inside and they invited everyone to take their slime out and some people were scared other people were delighted and you know moving it around and I think that's really like embracing the possible futures of quantum computer is it going to be disgusting or um will it allow us to touch kind of the other in a, in a positive sense or will it kind of be dehumanizing and so on um yeah so i think slime slime you know i've also spoken about the slimy um you know in english to be slimy means to kind of appear pleasant and um uh, to be a ple to be appear pleasant and trustworthy, but actually to be a slimy character means you're untrustworthy and unpleasant. So I feel big tech can be quite slimy. They present themselves a bit as being very benign, yet um, their intentions, when we dig into it, can be a big tech's intentions can be less less than desirable. So big tech are slimy as well. And re what Rebecca's showing now, perhaps we can loop it a little bit is um, the end video from Arbeit, um, where I kind of deconstruct the, um, 
this sort of problematic between be, big tech and art, specifically in relation to what I've made in this case, not a wider discussion around this, using slime. So actually slime can be this potential, this, this un, a sort of underlying quantum potential of something that allows us to deconstruct this um, less positive, these less positive um, belief systems, these capitalist narratives, Around around quantum computing and allow this other non-human, this liminal substance to take control. So for me, it has both it, slime plays a role, a, a multiple role. Um, it can be both positive, negative, and many different relations. So it moves beyond the binary and it really embraces all possible futures around quantum, quantum computing. love these images of the spill, the spill at the end because the slime feels like this just condensed metaphor and kind of parapsychological force behind all of the chrome and like the rotating object and the polish and um, the kind of lab aesthetic that is in, in, in these scenes that we're looking at right now. And I think I read in one of your um, talks Libby this phrase let me see if I can find it the slime like paradigm of the quantum sublime which I love and just this broad notion of the self like disturbed dispersed as she wrote through being and through yeah. time and in in a in AI AI uh, critical writing around AI and machine learning has generated so much about fungi and mycelial networks and slime as these captures not only of what like a collective or distributed intelligence feels like, but also as a representative of this, of this force beyond technology, like this scene exactly right here that, you know, kind of moves through any kind of binaries of like mastery, uh, master and subject or female and male or powerful and not powerful. Slime and slime mold are literally like interrelational, intersubjective forces. So when you talk about the deconstruction of binaries or what kind of stories can we have around technology, emerging technologies, quantum computing that are not based on extraction, not based on harsh binaries. I think of slime as you figured it here as a, a collective intelligence or a figure of contemplation that encourage us to think of um, a paradigm that blasts us out of our like solipsism or like, you know, a thousand and some years of like imperialist separation of, of being separate from nature. So when we think about entanglement, whether it's, you know, quantum or slimed, the slime representing this like, this, uh, you know, a psychic and a theoretical presence of like the hot soup of nutrients of like the primordial ooze that we bubbled out from. So I think of theory, uh, you know, we have been, theories like woven throughout this conversation we're having but when I think of shifting the narratives from, you know, political capitalist predictive controlling paradigm to one of interrelation, you need an entanglement paradigm. You need a slime aesthetics or viscous aesthetics that through which you can think of like refusing a fixed state or embracing the uncanny or the haunted or the things that are just behind the controlled and, and seeing where's a place for disgust and the fluid and the body in, in these like very highly controlled spaces. So it's fantastic. I'll, I'll let Monica speak. I'm, I'm going to take a more uh, technical approach to slime and uh, think about the um, slime as a Newtonian uh, fluid. So this uh, referring to, to this experience of touching and uh, manipulating the slime or just letting it flow is it's an interesting description, Libby, the, the way you, you put it, because um, by bringing slime into this uh, gallery world, you are bringing um, yeah, uh, almost counterintuitive way of experiencing fluids, because there is this viscosity, this uh, yeah, change in viscosity in slime that uh, creates this feeling that you can control something, but at some point, there is resistance 
So I think uh, I think this is a uh, yeah this could be a powerful uh, yeah sensorial metaphor to the spectators or the people who comes to the gallery. This touching something and uh, feeling how ple uh, pleasing it is to 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 touch it to move it to manipulate it, but at some point the uh, change in viscosity creates this projection, this resistance. So I, I was wondering, did you do that? Uh, yeah, thinking of this concept, or I, I am. So I'm I... sure, as a physicist, uh, you you have something inside you <laughs> that that yeah. you do to create uh, this kind of experience. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't specifically worked with a non-Newtonian fluid. I mean, I know what they are, of course, but the slime I make is like the kids' slime. Yeah. yeah so I don't know if you've seen like ASMR videos. Where... I think it works similarly. Huh? I think in uh, another like it, way, right? But uh... it 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 can, but there's many. Yeah, there are some, but I think the one that I've done is like. It, it doesn't go on Newtonian. I think I just went the simplest one because um, there's many <laughs> different ways you can make it. And some of them are quite non-Newtonian. But I think what happens, what I was thinking about is when people touch slime. I mean, we were, I mostly explored it in a, in, not at our bite, but we did the partner performance at Zabludovich Collection where if, at some point when everyone takes out their slime from the box, dead, it's very playful to assist them in thinking about what quantum computing is. I have a recipe for programming slime. And there I encourage everyone to take their slime and to pull it into two. So then I'm like quantum bit, zero and one at the same time. But then I start thinking about quantum entanglement, quantum algorithms, and I invite the audience to take a part of their slime and massage it into the person's hand next to them. And obviously this is quite intimate thing to do in a gallery. And I feel this has this pushback, like you just suggested. I know not about the non-Newtonian, but it has this reaction where people are like, you're asking me to take something that's quite unusual and put it into the hand of someone I maybe don't know so well, I don't know at all next to them. So there was both at the same time, this sort of maybe a pleasure of like putting, you know, like a stress ball, you get something out of kneading and pulling, but then this kind of intimacy this kind of maybe we're so used to being individuals that when you're invited to put slime into someone else's hands and massage there's this sort of um strangeness and this this reaction back so i think maybe that's what we had a similar idea but we came at it in different ways yeah. monica yeah thank you thank you so much um this question when we're thinking about like slimy people or the slimy world of tech would be that you're kind of criticizing outside of the projection space at our bike. Um, I guess I'm just wondering like, you know, because when, as Nora's kind of said, you know, when we name, when we name something, we kind of flatten it and it's this like uh, mirroring of our reality back onto us. So in that way is, is this kind of like unknowing or for the for the layperson like who who hasn't studied quantum physics or quantum computing, this kind of this naming where the naming of things is like even qubits, like this is very alien to a lot of people. Like, does that does that reinforce this kind of lack of trust or um, this lack of kind of like a belief system because we don't really know what it is? Um, I'm just thinking about like classical versus quantum computing and, and the ways in which we're maybe really skeptical of it because ultimately we don't really understand how it works and yeah it'd be good just to hear your thoughts on that Libby and Monica and Nora as well. I can, I can start quickly um so there's obviously like we talk about how AI is, has got a lot of myths and have, has been kind of artists obviously don't always help with this idea that you know that AI can be um you know, it's currently sentient or it's a collaborator or um, I guess quite often like these tools are mystified and um, quantum computing and because it's based on quantum physics, it's, this is often taken to the next level um, because the concepts are really counter, seemingly counterintuitive. I don't want to say that they can never be understood be because they can be, but we live in a Newtonian reality and, and that's our daily experience ultimately. 
um, we're used to thinking through, through, through these frameworks and these paradigms. Um, so the names in quantum, I mean, it can seem like a fiction. Like if you read some, if you were to go on the, you know, the preprint archive, AR, I can type it into the chat. Um, and just go, I mean, there's many, many places you can go and look at the language in quantum physics papers. But if you go into the quantum physics section of the archive, you can see lots, lots of papers. My old ones are there as well. And it just seems like language that is, is otherworldly, like, you know, like it doesn't feel like it's language that belongs to belongs to this reality. Um, so I don't think that helps our understanding of it, but it does allow a space when you go into this space of kind of fiction or the unknown or then there's, I always believe that like other possibilities can emerge. It can be quite a productive space in terms of things not being fixed. Um, so I guess it plays this naming of quantum concepts plays like a dual, dual role of like obscuring kind of how this technology works, but then could allow positive, I don't want to use the word positive, but new other alternative interpretations because they are so otherworldly and maybe that can be a good thing so it depends on what your what the aim is of, of naming quantum phenomena and I guess like going back to slime it's like slime is an aesthetic and is a tool and is a model almost a process as well that allows me to create a language around around quantum technology that enables people to to sort of experience and see it and touch it without having to like go into sort of the quantum literature of quantum tech quantum languages or the mathematics which can be quite opaque and challenging for people if they haven't got background in in the science thank you Libby I can see that we are coming to an end um, I would like to open up the conversation to any final thoughts that you might have, um, Nora, Monica, and also Libby. I'll let Monica go first. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, um, I think I think I'm going to uh, yeah emphasize in this. Yeah, final remark. The this idea of uh, um, but I I see this as a very important point in in your work, uh, Livy. Uh, this idea of uh, the collective body. This um, and uh, I find it very yeah relevant as well in many other artists' uh, works and uh, scientists as well, and many people dealing with yeah the complex questions of our contemporary uh, world and uh, so we we can take uh, i don't know judy uh, judith butler's account on this rejection of individualism and uh, connected with yeah thinking of society as uh, and, and all the planetary systems as a whole and how we deal with it in in, in this framework of uh, yeah, technological advancement and uh, scientific uh, yeah, acceleration. And, um, but then again, I think, I think we are in a moment in which there is this yeah, disenchantment around technology and we need to, uh, and I think you are focusing on that as well. So you are yeah, tackling just the right questions. Uh, in regards to yeah to the the responsibility we have with the knowledge the language the environment the others and um and uh, and i think there is uh, in the we are in 2022 and we've been for a while online and in this cyber uh yeah modeling uh, reality uh and um and there are so many things that we are trying to deal with in our uh, through the arts so you you are really tackling the the questions that many science, science fiction writers have been doing for yeah for the last century and um but again i think 
I think going back to another Butler, which is not Judith Butler, it's Octavia Butler. I think I think we are trying to imagine a world in which we we can combine the responsibility we have with the melancholy of the past. And I think um uh, and I think we can only do that by being and by doing it together. And um and this is where quantum all the quantum, not only technologies, but quantum media and yeah, as a whole can serve us as a yeah, a metaphor for that. How we can do this, understanding that everything is fluid, unknown, entangled, non-linear, and there is correlation around everything. So I think I think this yeah should be my last remark to to be fair with what you are dealing uh, in your work, Libby. So I'm thinking that maybe a lot of folks listening and everyone here is, you know, all on board with an inter an, a way of interdisciplinary thinking between the arts and, and science. But in my, in practice, um, something that is coming up in this conversation for me is the, what can a narrative do politically, culturally, and socially that a white paper cannot, and how can as in ML and AI, as in so much art and tech intersect, so many art and tech intersections, how does this conversation create a place for entry for non-experts, but then also for a feeling of agency and ownership about conversations around advanced or elite or cloistered technologies, whether you know emerging or present, oppressive or liberatory, just the, the need in, engineering and in design to talk about narrative systems right alongside them, narrative systems of having their own qualities of entanglement, their own ability to create multiple states. Um, I think we're this conversation makes an argument for new stories. And also for me, the question is knowing all that we do about technological harm and AI and ML, and the ways the hype and repetition these stories repeat are really embedded in technology. How can the emancipatory or revelatory aspects of quantum be computing be built into its narratives right now? And Livy, I think you beautifully do this beautifully, like you are building a visual language and a fiction around your work that allows us to consider um, what we're experiencing now, for example, with machine learning, this dawning feeling of being trained into pattern recognition and, um, the importance of having simulated visuals and like science communication, a visual language that communicates what collapse of binaries and classification might feel like. And you're insisting on multiplicity and multiple run states. So I'm, I'm curious to think about how artists may be harnessed in doing a lot of the work of communicating what quantum computing will feel, feel like and help companies sell their narratives and how artists as with technology in every era can bring in critical disruption and harness more interesting paradigms or slip them in, in Trojan horse style through their sensorial worlds and the visual worlds they build. And I would just end with, you know, asking how can we think about a continuation from the critical studies of technology in each era feed into critical narratives of quantum computing. So it's a lineage and the same questions aren't asked or discovered suddenly, you know, 10 or 15 years from now. These questions are being discussed and debated right now with artists and thinkers and writers. So having us be part of the conversation, whether you know ethics and criticality are part or not in these para-institutional, para-scientific spaces, which is, is where I hope some investment of resources can also go in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just as well on that, I mean, I suppose, Libby, you're kind of you're trying to make this world that that you've known. I think this is what gives you such a great, not privileged, but us being privileged to have have you as as somebody who has studied quantum computing, quantum physics. You've written papers on it. You're kind of you're inhabiting both worlds, and I think that's really important. It's really important by way of kind of like path making or like leading the way and in, in allowing other people to kind of understand where you're coming from through these very playful interactions. So you were talking about like pushing the slime together and really kind of 
allowing people, giving them accessible kind of tools and ways of thinking about the ways in which quantum works, but in a very kind of educational, very kind of didactic, tactile way. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm really curious as to kind of like where these leaders in quantum supremacy were, of course, they're kind of interested in this capitalist model, this kind of money making model. But but is is there a is there a kind of like lab or a group of people that are really interested in kind of expanding this knowledge to people like me and Nimco and my mom and all of these people that are perhaps not as invested? Like, is is there a, is there kind of money or resources being put into giving us something back that isn't just trying to sell us something more? So it's a really good question. Um, so I, yeah, I am, you know, I have this dual background and that maybe not always explicitly, but always implicitly informs my work. Um, obviously explicitly when I'm coding with quantum computing, but kind of uh, my experience, my lived experience as a scientist for like, I don't know, I guess I was doing it for like, how many years? 12 years, including my light degree, um, and then like PhD and then postdoc research. And that can be to do with like the politics of science, kind of how scientists view art. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, and this is anecdotal. It's, it's my interactions with people in the field and how they see themselves and how they see the world. And, um, you know, I spent some time in Singapore uh, working as well. So it's not just from, um, a European perspective, it, it, it was from like, a, you know, and I, I also spent some time in Brazil, only like a month, so less than Singapore, but also, um, you know, traveled to places like Durban in South Africa and other places. And, and you really get a sense of like what the whole community and um, the quantum computing community was much smaller back then. So I guess this, this informs kind of um, my viewpoint and comes across. So when I think about, you know, going back to what Nora was saying about how, uh, and I guess Monica thinks about this all the time, um, art and so artists and scientists interact, and perhaps if there's any value there or what those interactions mean, to whom, the power hierarchies and knowledge hierarchies of both sides and and so on, and 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 whether they can lead to any any other narratives that guide the process of quantum computing or quantum technologies because I mean we focus on quantum computing because that's the most famous one but there's all other technologies around around quantum quantum cryptography quantum sensing and 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 I mean I'm a little bit more pessimistic I think because I feel that from my interactions quantum scientists can be quite um you know it's a very male dominated field very and um they're very proud of rightly so because they are you know i mean in some sense they are really like people are really understanding things that are quite challenging conceptually and technically and understanding how to do but they're very pos positivist and tend to believe and again this is just my experience and i'm talking on an average so there's obviously exceptions here um believe that like science is like the true knowledge um don't really think it's their responsibility to think about the ethics of these technologies and actually just generally scientists physicists believe they're doing good for the world and that i think changes a little bit when you come encounter people working for the technology companies because of they're more aware of the debates around the ethics, but choose to pursue that path anyway. Whereas the scientists, particularly the ones working at universities are, um, are, are just really enamored with their science and really proud and love what they do. And a bit blinkered perhaps to like the wider questions, um, not, not through deliberate like ignoring. And I think in terms of like encouraging uh, lay people to understand, like I know for instance, IBM, um, have this lots and lots of resources for how to get into quantum computing. We've just launched something recently, like an ultimate beginners program. But I've been to one of their like hackathons and a lot of young people, university people. I mean, you still need some mathematical knowledge and some coding knowledge, but uh, there's a lot of free labor going, going on where like, you know, maybe 200 people turn up at one of their hackathons and um, everyone has to compete to win the hackathon and the prize is to go to the next hackathon. <laughs> and, um, and I just feel like, you know, everyone's giving away their knowledge to IBM 
in hope that they'll get a job at this company somehow. But what I'm trying to say is the resources are available, but there's issues around this. And it's very centered in the global north, although there are some touch points to the global south. Um, I don't believe there's many people trying to approach quantum from a non-capitalist point of view but by trying to educate lay people. Um, the scientists that do outreach um, who wouldn't necessarily be driven by capitalist narratives, but they're coming from this idea of linear progress. So I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, Karen, I mean, for me, as, as I've already mentioned, Karen Varad is a big touch point. And I think they do a really fantastic job at um, communicating the potential, radical potential of quantum to a wider audience as well. Yeah, I guess it's just interesting that it's it's always put down to the other sort of thinkers to try and make it accessible. Um, but yeah, I've got a really good question actually um, from one of the listeners, Kumbara um, Nakumbo, who's, who's an artist. Um, they ask, are there any ways that you know or hope to see in which non-linearity will be able to be experienced from or through the production of quantum computers or the research behind it? For example, are there any ways in which you see a trickle down effect of the quantum uh, concepts or quantum mechanics um, that could be experienced through user interfaces of quantum computers that insert these concepts into common knowledge? I mean, I think that kind of expands a little bit on what we were just talking about, but yeah, are there any sort of things that you know or hope to see um, within, within quantum computing that allows, allows it to become common knowledge? I'd quite like not to always start, but I guess I should probably answer this one. Um, I I wrote an Instagram post the other day, which was, I was just, oh, I did an interview with um, a magazine. and I quite often get asked the same question, so I was kind of decided just to speculate and, and go just think about stuff a little bit differently. And I was thinking about what a quantum, virtu a, a, a quantum virtual reality would be in the future, where... Um, users could, um, or a quantum experience, but something very interactive where a quantum computer was in situ interacting with a generative system. Because I, I don't obviously own a quantum computer, so my work, all the animations were pre-rendered pre and then put into this generative world. But could you imagine one, um, some sort of graf graphical interface in virtual reality where the games engine is productive and, and, and works through and reveals traces of quantum processes of the date using data from quantum entanglement and all the different quantum paradoxes and um, quantum the idea of quantum I mean the we, we always talk about the main concepts in quantum quantum superposition and measurement and collapse and entanglement but there's so many more which are just not in the public's consciousness which which through art or um, literature could 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 be brought into being and, and explored by a wider audience or for, or for music or other other means um, so yeah that's what I would suggest um, could happen but then and then I wrote about like how that would get appropriated by capital as well because I feel that to have it have this space of radical potential that's so heavily dependent on these tools that only the very richest companies in the world or governments in the world own wouldn't wouldn't be free it wouldn't be a free space for exploration it would be a profitable space I guess an extractive space at the moment but you know we could we could experience these effects and lay people could start to think in terms in principle start to think and feel in terms of these these binaries the problem with quantum computing is that that no one we don't have quantum computers just in our everyday lives um, at all. So it's still pretty much like a closed circuit of, of knowledge and of uh, experimentation, I guess. Um, there are, I mean, I always say this in every talk, there are quantum computers available to the public via IBM's website, five qubits. And I used to say you can't do much with, uh, with five, just five qubits, but I've really changed my mind um, on that after working with them recently. And I've, you know, you can extract a lot of data from entanglement, 
different quantum phenomena, phenomena you can really explore materially. So while there is a learning curve to get into, into this, but there is with any new tool, I, you know, artists and designers or anyone who wants to experiment with them should sign up. And there's a textbook, it's called Kiskit, uh, Q-I-S-K-I-T, that will guide you from like zero knowledge and to be able to work with, with these tools. So I think it's, I think even though they're owned by a big tech company, it's still worth like experimenting um, with them if you're keen. I don't know if Nora or Monica have any responses to um, how complex science trickles down to become part of, I mean, of course you do. <laughs> what would you like to say on this? I mean, I guess I had a question for you, Libby, sorry to throw it back to you, but I mean, something that I see often in um, just, you know, finish this book about like art and AI and artists and machine learning and the community that has grown over time um, around it, which is, you know, allows for this maybe lay person or more amateur form of knowledge being like elevated as well as a form of access and, and thinking and just being able to discuss like the, the basic concepts um, and the way that art has often formed this like intermediary space of like explication and explanation. I'm sure and I've read a bunch of your interviews and seen your talks and inevitably you have to just, you have to define what quantum computing is and basic basic concepts for the audience, which is which is important work and is, is um, but I wonder as like an artist who is, the first or one of the first to use quantum computing in their work and you have this highly trained background and you have the knowledge, I wonder how you see community developing when there is a lack of access to quantum computers, even if there is the IBM website, like, is there a teaching format? Are there models that you see in the future? What do you see artists doing in the future if they don't have access but are interested the way that they've been with machine learning and AI in the past? So I guess I guess at some point there'll there'll be different avenues. There'll be multiple strands. I guess at some point there will, uh, for instance, as IBM develop because they have this roadmap for quantum computing. I think they're going to reach two hundred something qubits this year and a thousand in a year or so. Maybe they'll give access to the twenty qubit ones that are not currently accessible, which you can actually do quite a lot with artistically. And then people will release code on GitHub and da 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 da. da. There's also like, I know in London, like uh, through Arbeit, through other spaces, there's an interest and a small community forming um, who want to learn how to experiment with these tools, to have like discussions and, and so on. And I suspect this is happening in New York because I know um, Dunham Raby at, New, at Parsons ran um, a quantum, what did they call it? Uh, they have run a quantum elective and I know they're interested in instead of quantum world building they call it quantum world hinting which I absolutely love and um, I think Monica actually gave a talk for to them as well so I suspect in New York there's a community forming around these ideas I know there's some scientists that are really working I mean they call it outreach and education but they're working on tools um, so there's a Finnish company called Cupola Learn I'm talking in very specific details to be concrete, but I mean, um, QPlay Learn, working on kind of interfaces. So to, you know, like there's runway ML that allow people to access machine learning out, uh, GANs and I think they have classification stuff in there as well. And um, so you don't need to know how to download code from GitHub and set it up on your computer and train it. And I think they're working on quantum tools, which will probably be simulated to begin with. Um, because all of the quantum, all of the small quantum computers can be still simulated classically, but what you get is you, you miss out on the kind of signature noise of the devices, which actually quite often one might filter out anyway. Well, it depends what you want to do, do with this. So, and then I know, for instance, Bob Cook in Oxford is working on like a, um, a diagrammatical theory of quantum computing where you don't need to know any maths. So there's all of these like scientists that are very um, up for educating, people who are up for working with, you know, the concepts of quantum have been in, been, been in the art world for a long time. So I think people are eager to start, start um, working with these things um, and, and I think will. 
yeah and i think that people will start releasing more and more code as well to do this what do you i mean what, what's your response Nora? what how do you see it developing given the past histories with ai and and so on because not everyone had a graphics card to train a model to begin with so while it wasn't as restricted as quantum computing it was still restrictive i think there was a there is currently a a lot of self reflection going on about the field of ai art and the ai art exhibition and research lab and the ways that certain models of artistic production can reify or affirm the computational logic that's being critiqued because you have um, amazing artists who also have huge teams and also have access to huge labs and massive collaborations. And so I think that like from the side of criticism, there's been more celebration in writing about the field. But now that now there's a kind of six, seven year stint that has gone on in, in AI art and then pause for reflection about how does this field also, you know, perpetuate or accelerate or advance in this very subtle culture washing, soft wash way, um, the imperatives of, of certain companies. And so what I find often like artistic collaboration can do is but to, to use the thing incorrectly to find other narratives, paradigms, um, and fictions like we've been discussing that can that go into like the cultural world around the tech-based art, whether it's quantum computing or AI or ML, is there is another expanded field in which people relate to technology every day that don't have access to the logic or the engineering or the programming behind, like I use my computer and my phone every day, but I don't need to know how it works from moment to moment to know how it affects me and my life and my thinking. I have There's another form of language, narrative and storytelling around um, technology's role in our life. So I've always seen artists as that intermediary space of developing that dialogue, bringing people in and forming, um, forming a different kind of language that doesn't, that isn't focused just on the tool and, this, and the technicality. It's, it's both, our experiences is, is both. So it's my general reflection. I have actually just received like quite a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask them really quickly. Um, we've got one from Anna who says, what is Newtonian plus physics? Uh, does this refer to computer physics simulation? Um, Libby, I don't know if you can answer that. I said that earlier, didn't I? And I've forgotten about what context I said it in. Newtonian plus. Oh, in, in games engines. Yeah, because what I was thinking about, I remember why I said it. I was thinking about games where, say, I could fly. So I'm still kind of embedded in a Newtonian world. But then there's games where you have more fantastical elements. That's what I meant by that. Um, so you're still, it's not like you've, you've, it's not like the games engine is being used in a quantum way, but it's being used kind of in a Newtonian way, but with elements that would not exist in in reality, that's what I meant. And it's just something I made up on the spot. Um, but I mean, in science terms, if you want to know, there are like semi-classical theories which sit between quantum and um, classical that allow certain models where you just need a bit of quantum to get predict the correct results from experiments. Mm -hmm. I know, I hope that answers your question. Um, and we have a, a comment from Most Dismal Swamp as well, um, who says, I think slime in its non-Newtonian dynamics is certainly an interesting model since it undermines what I think is the largely bogus and ide ideological presumptions of the rhetoric of fluidity. Um, a slime suggests a kind of intractable weight agency body as well. So this reminds us to ask what is being entangled or super positioned rather than moving their material agencies. So I wanted to ask Libby whether the materials she has worked with, digital materials, data, or even concepts or ideas, um, or even presumed binaries such as fact or fiction, have presented themselves in her process as stubborn or recalcitrant or even to influence the direction of the work. So do your materials influence the direction of the work, Libby? Um, yes. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I like that, like the, I mean, I'm trying to remember the whole question. I wish I could see it visually so I could refer back to it. Can you put it in the chat anyway, Rebecca? Um, but like this idea, yeah, this presumed sort of like um, idea around fluidity. Um, let me have a look. But largely bogus and ideological presumptions of the rhetoric of largely bogus fluidity. Intractable, yeah, I like the idea of tractable service prices. To ask what, sorry, I have to like think carefully, is what we, yeah. Do you really age? Uh, so, I mean, gosh, <laughs> right at the end. So, um, yeah, I mean, what is being entangled and what is being excluded is super important because, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's all of these sort of almost in quantum, taking quantum as a metaphor for how I work. I use it kind of as a process and a model of, of how I work in general. And quite often I like to set up um, like opposing narratives or opposing things, um, points, binaries, and then deconstruct them into a set of relations. So like how my video initially presented itself, the one with the slime in as like a product launch of this fictional company QX with the immersive experience. But then I started using slime and reconfiguring it and deconstructing the video itself. Um, so when, when you think of like setting up an entanglement or setting up a relation, you're also excluding other possibilities. And that's like a responsibility in what you're doing. So I'm not thinking about I'm not kind of just saying, oh, there's entanglements in general. I'm thinking really carefully about which things I'm working with. Um, and the materials, I mean, the, let me think about what I'm doing with the um, quantum data. So I've, with ENT, I've worked with um, quantum entanglement a lot as a material. And when you're working with it in a quantum computer, what's entangled are the qubits. And they're numbered one to 10 or whatever. Um, but then I'm using that data to um, de deconstruct images and to sort of entangle with the audience, I suppose, in end. Um, and then I let go of the work in the sense that how the audience respond and this group in the space, or maybe it's an individual in the space. I, I have, I mean, I it's a bottom up, it's an emergent response to the work. Um, so while I'm deconstructing the forms in the work, which are these hybrid creatures, um, then how the audience react to these patterns immersing them and decaying is, is something that um, I have no control over. It's like this emergent process. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> I'm trying to think what has been stubborn. I think there's probably been lots of stubborn binaries and so on in, within the work, but I need to, maybe someone else can just say some words on this while I have a think and then come up with something a bit more like in depth. But it's a good question. Thank you, Dane. Yeah, I feel like that was quite, um... It was more for you, Libby, but I think I think you kind of answered it. I think you kind of answered it. I mean, I'm sure uh, Dane will message you if, if uh, he has <laughs> a, uh, I know we chat sometimes on Instagram, so feel free to message me. <laughs> we can have a chat about it separately. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm in uh, Maybe on this, um, on this note, um, we could end. I can see that it is half past eight. So thank you so much, everyone, both our panelists for the wonderful conversation and everyone in the audience. Um, Libby's show, The Evolution of Ent, QX, is currently on show here at Arbyte until the 20th of August. And thank you again, Nora, Libby, and Monica for your amazing insights on art, sciences, and criticism. And yes, on this note, I would like to end our conversation and wish everyone a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Okay, baby. Hey. Okay. <laughs>